you know, so Christopher, I think that I've known you. I, I met you for the first time in 2012 at the Salon du Chocolat in New York. You were on a stand and you had just introduced the Good and Evil Bar, which is the project that you were doing with both um, Eric Repair and um, Tony Bourdain. And then we've had an opportunity over the course of the ensuing years. Um, you were in, you were also on a trip to Peru during the Salon del Cacao y Chocolate and La Ruta del Cacao afterwards. I believe you were at the Academy of the Cacao then in Nicaragua one year. Cool. And then also you were at um, the Festival del uh, Chocolate in Tabasco and Villahermosa one year, where you were also a judge for the Concurso del Cacao. We're looking for the best cacao in uh, the state of Tabasco in Mexico. And, you know, I think what's interesting and what I would like you to talk about when we get together on Friday is that you have a much more class, you have a much, you have a classical background. I mean, you studied or you worked with people like Pierre Marcolini and then Dender in Belgium and in Copener in Germany. You come from this classic training when you opened up your business in the United States, you know, it started out as a confectionery business and that is where you've built your reputation. And, but you also have this connection going back at least to the work that you did with, um, Eric and Tony on the Good and Evil Bar of interested in getting involved in making chocolate from the beans. And now at a clot in Pennsylvania, where you are, you are doing making chocolate from beans. And we have a bar here, and we will be tasting it, you know, during during the the interview on Friday. But you know, can you tell us a little bit about you know some of the struggle? If in fact there are a struggle, I mean, you're known for one thing. How does the industry you know see you? And you know, what's the challenge of being sort of like a conventional confectioner and the the what you're doing in terms of making chocolate and introducing bean to bar chocolate into your into your business. Right. I think the fun thing is we've kind of confused people. They're like, what is a clot? Is wait, are they making chocolate? No, they're not making chocolate. They are? Wait. So everyone's sort of, you know, they're a little confused about what we do, which and that's kind of fun. I mean, we're driven by what we're passionate about and what brings us in, in you know reason to get up in the morning so So welcome everybody to today's The Chocolate Life Live. My name is Clay Gordon, I'm your host, and today I'm joined by Christopher Curtin of Eclat de Chocolat in Pennsylvania. I'm from New York. Christopher, how are you today? Good, it's windy Glad. out there. <laughs> you no, know, it's, it's incredibly windy here as well, and the sun is going in and out, and at least it's above freezing, which is a lovely thing, um, a lovely thing, because it's been a pretty, pretty interesting week weather-wise here in New York. Now, you know, you and I have, you know, you know had a chance to talk on, a number of occasions um, in setting up today's interview. And what I really want to do is, you know, focus in to start with on, you know, where you came from, your background. Because when I think about many of the people who are in the, you know, the craft chocolate industry, you know, making chocolate from cocoa beans, not all of them have a sort of conventional classical background and classical training. And, you know, my understanding is, you know, you spent quite a bit of time um, you know, I had a three-year gap year between my freshman and sophomore years in college, and you, you know, went to culinary school, took a year off that turned into 14 years. Can you, can you tell us about those 14 years? Yeah, I mean, I, I knew I wanted to be a chef, and so I started at a prominent cooking school, pastry school in, in the States, and I'm like, why am I paying so much money when I could be literally learning from a horse's mouth? So... I had a connection to Cologne, Germany, so I went there and somehow got stuck there for 14 years and actually went ahead and did my Meister exam there to become a master pastry chef, which includes small breads, chocolates, pastries, and a lot of other things. So it's 
it's not just chocolate. So it's, it's a good time. So after getting, after passing your exam, you had an opportunity to move around in Europe. And so did you, were you immediately drawn to the confectionery side of things, working with chocolate? I mean, did sugar work come into you? Did you want to pursue laminated doughs and baking and things like that? Or was chocolate what it is that you wanted to do? I mean, lamination doughs are one of my favorite things to make. It's very zen and kind of, but it's a lot of work. And so, but that's so great thing about being a pastry chef is you're working with so many different mediums. But then I sort of fell into the, the chocolate world and had a chance to work at Copenhagen and learned high end, but large, they're a midsize, but for estates, it's large manufacturing mm -hmm. techniques, which I saw it could be sort of, pared down and done with an artisan approach to it. So that's where it's basically having a chance to work at such a company that said, I want to work with just chocolate and zero in on that. So that was quite interesting. We were doing bean to bar back then. So that's, I keep thinking how old I am, 28 years ago, I think. Well, I mean, when you think about it, you know, at, it, it, if any company, I mean, Lint is a bean to bar chocolate maker. I mean, yeah, they, they didn't call it bean to bar, but yeah. right. And yeah, well, but they have a brand, Girardelli, and on the front of the bar, it says proudly bean to bar, our commitment to ultimate quality. And so, you know, bean to bar is, yeah, if you start from beans and you end in bars, it doesn't really matter how big you are. You know, this question of am I a craft scale producer? Am I an artisan scale producer? But you've gone from, you know, Copener and you know, you're influenced by, you know, these amazing work that's being done in in Spain. So Enrique Rovira, um, perhaps less so Oriol Balaguer, but also, um, you know, what's going on there. You have this, you know, this these people in Belgium, um, Van Dender being one, Pierre Marcolini being in another. And I think about, you know, Marcolini, he's known as a pastry chef, you know, having visited Brussels on a number of occasions. I prefer to go to the He's known for a lot of things, but we'll, we'll, just... <laughs> well, that's true. That is true. He's known for many things. Uh, you know, and he he does some manufacturing of single origin chocolate bars. I mean, it's a relatively small production compared with, you know, the amount of the amount of work that he produces. And he uses some, you know, high technology. I mean, we think about using one shot machines, you know, and there he has a frozen cone machine. I'm sitting in his um, in, in his factory. And so we think about, okay. And I think this is an interesting point that um, we can talk about is that, um, you know, when we talk about innovation, you know, what's new, you know, what is new, you know, it, you know, salted caramels has been around since forever. Um, it, you know, if you're making a product and you don't have a salted caramel, you know, you're leaving money on the table, but when you're innovating, um, and these are, you have, we have samples of things. You've got more than just the single chocolate bar that you sent me. Thank you very much. But, you know, you know, how, you know, you've got a couple of different aspects you can think about. Number one is you can play with flavor and then you can also play with the form of something and you can play with the design. And so how does your background inform um, how it is you approach the, those three aspects of the work that you do? I'll kind of start sideways and then get into the question. I mean, I basically choose my apprenticeship or my place I work for what I could learn. I know Copenhagen doesn't necessarily make as high a quality product as Marcolini or Van Dender, but if you can pipe H's on truffles for six hours straight, you're going to get, you know, that's 20 years experience at another place. So of just manual labor. So I really picked places that would put me through the paces of, of manual labor so I get those skills as fast as I could. And then you take those you know, sort of skills in production and organization and you see how Van Dender was doing it at a much smaller scale. And then you can kind of combine those two and sort of do a hybrid. So every place I worked at was, there was a really a lot of thought behind it, why I wanted to work for them. And usually I walked in and said, I want to work for you because you had, you know, you do this the best in the world. And they're like, Oh, thank you. Of course you're hired. So that usually helps. Or when I was a cook, I would go in and I said, I had the scallops last night. They're beautiful. I want to work for a place that does that type of quality. And they're like, you actually came to dinner here last night? I'm like, of course. Like, this isn't a one-way interview. I'm also <laughs> interviewing you. So uh, and that's something to think about when you try out or want to work someplace. Just not do it just because it's a job. 
Well, let me let me see if I can jump in here. I mean, you know, one of the things that I've noticed, um, you know, from my work with people who are in the beer world is that if I'm a microbrewer, even if I'm a home brewer, you know, I'm eating, I'm drinking, you know, beer from every place I can think of. You know, I want to know influences. I want to know technique. I want to know style because that that's how I'm going to learn. But I don't necessarily see that same commitment to tasting among small chocolate makers. You know, they're in the kitchen all day long. They're eating their chocolate. They're not necessarily eating, you know, 47. You know, if I'm making a single origin Madagascar from Atkinson Estate beans, do I go out and try to purchase 30 other Atkinson Estate, you know, 72%, you know, made in a melanger beans to find out what it is that I'm doing that might be different or better or not as good, how I might improve. So, you know, when it comes to your creative process, um, how much of it is just being basically omnivorous, going out there and tasting stuff and bringing it back into your creative process. I'm, I'm mixed minds with it because once you see something, then you can't do that. So, you know, like Dominique Ansel's, you know, marshmallow flower that opens up is so gorgeous and, and has that restraint on it. It's like, ah, oh, I wish I'd thought about it because now I can't do it, you know? So sometimes it's better not to see ideas or we've seen packaging designs from 10 years ago that's still in my head and we design the packaging and and like last minute we see that it's just exactly like uh, like whoops and so we had to rechange things so sometimes it's good uh there's an old classic food movie that everyone should see tampopo and i won't give you the whole story but basically they go along and they dig through the the trash and see what bones they're using to make their ramen stock and everything else. And that is so Japanese to this day. They will go through other pastry shops trash to see what products and what ingredients they're using. And so, you know, having lived in and worked in Japan almost a year, it's, it's really sort of amusing to see that. And of course, when we go to Paris, we go around and see what they're doing. And, you know, the more you're in the business, the less new you see. It's like going to the Salon de Chocolat in Paris, like mm -hmm. first time you go there you're like blown away and it's like that it's like yeah but you have to be curious of what you know other people are doing but more instinctively you want to be wowed you know you know what you're doing personally but nothing gives me more pleasure than going to another shop and like wow that is amazing that pastry or that caramel and that's that's why we're here and that's why it's exciting but you know you'll never have those experiences if you don't do that, it's like a chef. Chefs should be constantly going out to dinner all the time if you can afford it. So let's let's talk about one thing. I mean, which you know you are known for, and this is a mandiant as opposed to a mendiant. And let's see if we can get. I mean, it is um, obviously it's a disc. Um, it is. I'm sorry. It's it's very very thin. People can get an idea. Um, it is a form of truffle. There is a filling in here, right? And you're using. A structure sheet on the back of it to get a texture and so you're combining a bunch of different machines and techniques and tools where did the inspiration for the mandiant come from i mean i think what's interesting is once you've done something for so long you know you don't you're not thinking like a formula one driver doesn't think all of a sudden left turn right turn it's all instinctive so a lot of that is just by doing this for so long but then you have to be sort of still a little bit impish and silly and say, you know, kind of like, let's just flatten a truffle. You know, literally the, the, the old joke of Bambi meets Godzilla. I don't know if anyone's seen that where this. It's one book. of my favorite animated shorts. It's, it's so, fabulous. And that's like kind of, you never know where creativity or where ideas come from. I'm like, let's mm -hmm. do that with a truffle. So we played around with the ratios, of course. And then we're also working on something called flavor release and, you know, we're very inspired by Al Bouli and what he was doing. And he had this carrot foam where you just inhale it. And because of there's so much air, you instantly got this wall of carrot. Mm -hmm. And so how do you work with, you know, like a chewy caramel is going to give you flavor for much longer, but slower mm -hmm. than our liquidy caramel, which I didn't see anyone doing it. I, you know, everyone has the same techniques and stuff. So I think people sort of hit the wave at the same time. Mm -hmm. But I hadn't seen it when I before I came back from Europe. So we started doing these liquidy caramels that were written up in Vogue, and, and we've gotten a lot of press for. But it says, how do you increase the flavor by 
the flavor release and how do you work with form and function and those are a lot of things that are, we're kind of dabbling with is mm-hmm. you know how thick should a chocolate bar be and what storyline you want to tell you know a really thick chocolate bar is fun but it's going to tell a different story than a really micro thin bar so those are things and even inclusions how big should the inclusions be right if, if, you, if you put them in a launcher and they're flat together you're going to get chocolate coffee like this if you have them bigger you're going to have like these little ebbs and flows so gotcha. yeah so it's a this is a milk chocolate outside with a milk chocolate center it's a ganache center is that correct uh that's probably the peanut butter right I haven't tried this before. I'm trying it for the first time. Hazelnut. We sent you the hazelnut and the peanut butter. And that's only, there's no ganache filling in those. Oh, so it's a, a jandouille, a praline that's the filling? Uh, deconstructed jandouille. How's that? Okay. Um. You know, it, you know, you have the center which is in this, and then you have the, the chocolate on the outside of it. And I'm going to assume that um, that if there is chocolate in whatever the the filling is, it's the same chocolate in both places. And, you know, you and I had this conversation, you know, earlier in the week around, you know, should we be adding cocoa butter to chocolate? You know, if I'm making a two-ingredient chocolate, why am I not making a three-ingredient chocolate? And one of the one of the topics that we spent quite a bit of talking about, quite a bit of time talking about was this notion of, flavor release right so you know the you know a two ingredient chocolate will melt a particular way and so it will release flavors in a particular way a three ingredient chocolate right with more cocoa butter and in general in the in the kitchen you know fat equal flavor right and you have this real different um flavor uh, flavor profile um so there's a surprise here in terms of texture because you're thinking of flat discs and normally you think about a bite of a chocolate bar. But it has a different bite, right? And this is the hazelnut, I believe, not the peanut. And um, the way the, the, the filling uh, melts into your mouth is mediated by the thin chocolate coating on the outside. And so it has a real, real different um, mouthfeel than a a jandouille, a, just a, a, a you know just a just a piece of jandouille. It's really, really interesting. Um, have you ever used this format and done anything other with the centers? We've done caramel. We've done just straight up liquor from the Peruvian. We've done. Mm-hmm. We've played around. I mean, we haven't hit our stride with it. I mean, there's so many fun little projects we can do with it, mm-hmm. but. Um, you know, you're kind of bipolar with, you know, you have to be silly and, and think of these wacky projects, but then you have to have sort of the, the training to like sort of narrow it in and play with it. So it's kind of a, you got to be both sides of it for sure. I understand. <clears throat> but um, the, two, the two ingredient, I'm glad you touched that. It's, you know, I respect that whole sort of school because, you know, you're trying to make amazing chocolate with limited, you know, without the addition cocoa butter. So it's, it's really quite fascinating, actually. I mean, that's not what we want to go for the best tasting or what we believe is the best tasting product. Mm-hmm. And we believe normally to add enough more cocoa butter, unless the cocoa beans already have enough natural cocoa butter. Mm-hmm. But sort of the reason why people drive Harley Davidson. I mean, there's a sort of a romantic sort of, you know, romance to driving a Harley where I'm probably going to get myself in trouble here, where a Ducati and a BMW motorcycle shifts smoother and is a better motorcycle, but a Harley feeds the soul in a different way. And maybe that's the whole two mean ingredient. No, I actually, I, you know, there, I think there's a great um, analogy in there is that, you know, different styles of product appeal to us in different kinds of ways. You know, if I'm a, a motorcycle enthusiast, I might have a Harley for a particular mood or emotion that I'm in. Right. And I might have a Japanese superbike for something else entirely. And then, you know, having an Italian bike would give me an entirely different, uh, an entirely different um, kind of experience. Um, so you, you've 
been in business in West Chester, Pennsylvania for something like 16 years. All right. When did you start making oh, 17 this month? So yeah. Okay. Okay. So quite a while. And you know, when did you start making you obviously have a background in making chocolate from the bean, even as part of the training that you did. But when did you say, okay, I'm gonna bite the bullet and start making chocolate from the beans? Um at your place in Philadelphia or in, in Westchester? We've always dabbled with it and we've always had it ongoing since the beginning. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really till we bought a, a McIntyre last year or two years ago. Mm -hmm. The whole COVID thing has thrown us out. Like the time, you know, I think two years ago we bought the, the McIntyre. And since then we've been making more and more and more and more. Um, so, mm -hmm. Uh, but before that, we had smaller machines, melanchers, that sort of thing, which are which are fun. Uh, yeah. But for the style that we personally do, we really needed a good ball mill or a McIntyre of that. You know, the, basically the things, if you want to make the style I want, is where the style I learned. And so that's all European. So ball mills or McIntyres is what I like to work with. Right. Or McIntyre, if I have my choice. Right. I don't understand. So a, a universal, a, a, a standard right. universal, you know. And then there has a large ball mill that does. He does amazing stuff with. I'm um, sorry. Who does? Uh, Van Dender. Van Dender. Absolutely, absolutely. But uh, I prefer McIntyre's. I understand. So you know, no wrong. one of the so people who have known me for quite some time know that I had a 20th anniversary of the Chocolate Life uh, back in um, May. And Christopher, you know, you were, you know, good enough to supply me um, a chocolate bar for that. It's a 2000 harvest um, from Nicaragua. The beans are from Ingeman. Um, and, I, and, you know, people who caught the introduction will know that um, you spent some time with me at the Academy of the Cacao um, in, um, in Nicaragua, where we went around to the farms and stayed in really bad hotels and, and <laughs> ate some pretty They were so bad, they were good. Food. <laughs> they were so bad. They were interesting stories. So, you know, I, you know, I have two bars. Thank you very much. We have the Nicaragua here. And one of the things that I've noticed from, you know, May <clears throat> when I received this bar until today is that it is a fundamentally different chocolate than it was. But, you know, what drove you to choose these beans in particular when you started off? Do you remember? Uh, they were given to me. <laughs> <Okay>. <clears throat> but that's not the answer i i should stick to but um no they're i mean they're amazing beans and you know our friends in denmark and other places are using them to make some amazing chocolate they're fairly easy to work with you you know they're not you know too difficult to get something decent out of them uh they're just amazing beans so you know why not you know we, we, I mean, we have the whole gambit here. We have some beans that are really interesting if we work around it. We, of course, done that great project with uh, Noe, with our friends up at Fruition, which was, I still don't know if it's in my head or not, where we basically have his style, my style, like running parallel. So uh, Brian, of course, at Fruition. And because, of course, we roast usually a little darker than the American craft chocolate makers, not severely, but a little bit. And so... You can almost, I don't know, maybe like I'm making this up, but you can almost, I think you can almost taste the two different styles of chocolate making in one bar. So, In that no way bar? The no way bar. Interesting. You know, what I like about this, you know, as I said, I've had a chance to taste it over the course of six months almost, um, is that it has really changed in complexity. I mean, there's some really, really nice fruitiness now which wasn't as apparent very early on um, um some of that roast is there some of that heavier roast is there in a bitterness you know a fleeting bit of astringency which is sort of like a walnut skin astringency um but there's this really really nice evolution right it's not necessarily you know beat you over the head with chocolate which is not necessarily what i think of you know this variety of that either but I'm yeah. sorry? It wouldn't be the bean for that, but no, absolutely. Which is, I was going to say, I mean, the genetics for here are a neo criollo or an acriollado. So it is a Nicaraguan bean which got sent to Trinidad and it came back and rehybridized with local Nicaraguan beans um, over the course of you know several hundred years. Um, but 
you know, long finish. And what's really, really interesting is that all this fruit and all this roastiness that as it's leaving your mouth, there's just this really, really soft chocolatiness, right? Which is on the end finish of this, which is, you know, you know, the, the flavor journey, the evolution and, you know, is there chocolate here? Is there chocolate here? Is there chocolate here? And all of a sudden, you know, at the end, it it it, it comes through. It's really, 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 really quite lovely. I, I want to take a quick moment, if I can, reset. We're here on the Chocolate Life Live. Our guest, Christopher Curtin of the Clot Chocolat in Pennsylvania. Um, if you're watching us live, you'd like to um, in, become a part of the conversation, um, put a comment or a question in the chat replay box or in the chat box. And um, Christopher and I will uh, see it and we can respond to it. Let us know um, what it is that interests you and we're happy to go and answer whatever questions you have um, about it. So, you know, Christopher, if we can really, really quickly, um, what I want to let people know if I can is, um, you know, you are known for, and this is how we first met back in 2012, at the New York Chocolate Salon, the Salon du Chocolat in New York, um, for this project with um, um, Eric Repair and, and Tony Anthony Bourdain. Um, uh, and um, I see that you have uh, this good and evil bar. I see that you also have a new Peruvian Nacional bar. Uh, you sent me a copy of it. It's, it's here. Um, and I'm going to take it out. Is Is this the same genetics as um... same farms but we have really special sourcing so we have the first harvest every year so hence first harvest so we have access to the the best bean of that harvest mm -hmm. and that's one of the differences of of the peruvian national that we're serving a lot of the top beans um, so we it looks like there's an inclusion here is that correct the inclusion is when we take make the chocolate we remove some of the nibs Mm -hmm. And we add it back in when we make gotcha. Hence, the original good and evil, but then we love the structure. And, and, you know, when you're making chocolate and you smell that liquor, there's, if we can only put that in the bar somehow, it, it's just euphoric. And I think that's most, a lot of the craft chocolate makers are like, how can we get that in the bar stable, you know, smell? Cause it's just absolutely incredible. Every time it, it never gets old. And so that's what we're trying to do is get that sort of honesty and sort of the true chocolate flavor back in while we have more of a polished European style chocolate. So you know, trying to tell sort of an interesting story there. I'm crunching on this bar and I don't want the crunching necessarily to be a part of the audio soundtrack. So I had forgotten that I had muted myself. I mean, you know, I, you know, I don't remember what the original good and evil bar tasted like or smelled like. I mean, I mean, this is, you know, when I think of this Peruvian Nacional, you know, Marignon, if I can say what the origin is, what I like about this um, is if I just bite on it, make a couple of quick chews. And let it melt. I mean, you're right. There is this wonderful sort of European thinking. I mean, there's a there is some. I'm guessing some added cocoa butter in here. Um, I'm guessing I didn't look at the back label, but it has this really, really wonderful melt and a flavor on its own. But you know, you talked about the size of inclusion. So you know, sieving up my guess the nibs to get a particular size into here and that crunch and combine with a melt um, is a is sort of a, a larger experience if I can, right? It's not as one dimensional and it delivers these hits of chocolate flavor in an interesting kind of way through the, through the nibs. And the nibs are roasted the same way as the, as a, yeah, no. Um, same, same nibs, we just pull them out of the winnower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what origins excite you? What, where, where are the next places that we might expect a new chocolate from, from you? I mean, Mexico is, you know, we, we are really trying to, as much as I love Madagascar and the African beans, and it just seems there's such amazing 
talent of beans down in South and Central America, where why are we not just pulling from there? I mean, that's, you know, shipping beans around the world. I mean, environmentally, unfortunately, I can't grow beans in Pennsylvania, but um, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. But it'd be really interesting just to sort of zero in on that, because we can even sail it up if you wanted, or bring it up by boat, or mm -hmm. other less or more environmentally sound ways and flying things around the world. So, uh, or even freight, you know, that's not very, you know, earth, earth friendly either. So we're looking for ways of, of dealing with that. And the beans, as we said, Nicaraguan beans are just absolutely stellar. Mm -hmm. Some things that are going in Mexico are absolutely amazing. And you can just have your pick of a variety there. Well, we were, we were, you know, I was, you know, involved in a project over the course of several years down in the state of Tabasco in Villahermosa. And in 2019, we organized as a part of that project a, uh, a, a contest to pick the best beans in, um, in Tabasco. And this is a shot of the judging that was being done one day. Uh, that's you. On the left is Sophie Vanderbecken of Le Chameleon, a, a, a chocolate maker out of Mexico City. At the far end of the table, is uh, Zoe Papalexandratu. Zoe is a an expert in post harvest processing, specifically fermentation. And one of the connections there is that she was involved in doing most of the post harvest work in terms of developing the protocols uh, for Ingeman. So the the beans from Nicaragua. And I was Zoe on that trip when you were there. Did you have a chance to meet Zoe? I think she was. Visit? Yeah, I seem to remember. Um, to Zoe's left, so our right, the next person is uh, Maria Salvador Jimenez. Uh, Maria runs the specialty cocoa program at Darnhauer in um, the Netherlands out of Zenbam. And just to um, the right of her is Elisa uh, Welty, now Elisa Bona. And at the um, at the far right is Stefan Bona. So it's a very, very interesting judging, judging panel. Um, we had the opportunity to visit the research center where a lot of the, so the, 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 the state agriculture uh, ministry does its work. I mean, do you have any particular, I mean, I have some specific memories of, you know, Stefan's responses to some of the cocoa and the, some of the chocolate that we were trying. Um, do you have any specific um, memories of, you know, you know, you obviously have come away with this was a positive. Um, positive yes, there's, there's so many people that, you know, work on just the fermentation or even just working on the canopy and letting enough air out in through the canopy and um and things like that and you look at someone like bona who gr literally grew up making chocolate and i remember the most interesting sort of insightful things is when we cut the beans open or the pods open mm -hmm. and we're just smelling the pulp and tasting the pulp and it's like ah and how the acidity can change the fermentation product and that you know, it's like, it's one of the things that's the most obvious as a chef, like, of course, the city will change it. But until you sort of have that aha moment, it's like, oh, yeah. So things like that, you know, uh, happened a hundred times during that trip. But it kind of mm -hmm. gives another knowledge of everything that goes behind amazing chocolate maker, like Bona and other people like him. So, you know, and I remember... You know, the, the other judge, the, the woman sitting to the your left is Gabby Ruiz, and she's actually known as one of the best chefs um, in the state of Tabasco. We had and some great we, meals there. Uh, we absolutely. And when we talk about, you know, being open to tasting things, I mean, I, I think you, you were more enamored of this, but I think we had a, a beef dish which had ant egg sacs on the top of it. And I think you were going, oh my gosh, this is absolutely amazing. And I'm going, huh, ant egg sex. I'm gonna, I'm, I personally am gonna have trouble, um, you know, consuming this. So, you know, we talked about, you know, um, a little bit about this. Um, is, you know, where do you? Th so, where do you think, if I can, the, the most interesting flavor inspiration came from in your travel? Something you said, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I want to get this flavor into a chocolate and you know what 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 might that have been wow that's that's a tough one because they're they're happening all the time you know well, if i can i mean let's 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 bring up an interesting example if i can right i mean the two you know everyone's asked have you ever come up with something that didn't work and i don't think anything offhand but 
one of my jobs was to reformulate recipes to sort of do product lines for other people. So, you know, all, for a year, all day long, all I do is reformulate recipes. So there's a lot going on in the head before it comes into, you know, into the mm-hmm. chocolate. So we did a lemon with tapenade. So it's like a Moroccan cured lemon with tapenade. That was really interesting. So and olives, happened. you're talking about black olives? Exactly. Talking about the okay. So you getting more of the salty earthiness from the black olive than the preserved lemon. Mm-hmm. That sounds strange, but when you eat it, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, our mushroom and thyme bar, the parallel bars that we I do. I was going to bring the porcini mushroom and thyme bar. Sounds bars. strange, but once you try it and more of the umami flavor of the mushroom, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I think you just have to be open to – and. It's, you know, I say this all the time. I learn more things outside of my field than in my field. So when I'm mm-hmm. traveling and I see something or I hear I see a craftsman, you know, spackle a wall or something or, you know, I'm like, wow, we can use that in the showpiece. Or mm-hmm. there's a constant sort of evolution of, of knowledge, but you have to kind of step outside your own craft or learn mm-hmm. more, I think, after, after a certain point. And, um, you know. You know, these parallel bars, I think, are just a lot of fun. It, it says, okay, we have a piece of equipment which is capable of doing something. What are some new and perhaps interesting and different ways we can use this piece of equipment? And, you know, this is an example. And what you're doing is you're having one of the chocolates is flavored one way. And another of the chocolates is um, another way. And I, you know, I have long been a fan of doing things like, you know, taking a milk chocolate, a thin milk chocolate and a thin dark chocolate. And then playing with the difference in, you know, how I perceive flavor and aroma based on whether the milk chocolate is on my nose or the milk chocolate is on my tongue. And, you know, um, you know, dried mushrooms have a particular kind of a particular kind of flavor profile as opposed to a fresh mushroom. And then, um, you know, mixing, right, mixing in my mouth, the white chocolate and the milk chocolate and the flavor and the earthiness of the thyme and the earthiness of the mushrooms just um, mm. But I mean, th- that's a classic example of sitting around after service with a friend at a friend's restaurant up in New York. We're just talking about flavors and flavor profiles, and mm-hmm. you know, just overall foodie mm-hmm. things. And we brought up mushroom and thyme, and that kind of almost as a dare to throw the gauntlet down of. Mm-hmm. How can you incorporate mushrooms that make sense? And and a lot of the things we do is just sort of like, how can we do things that don't make sense at first? So, mm-hmm. and, you know, it's just being, as I said, I mean, there's a silliness that has to be, is really important. I mean, some people think I'm pretty serious, but I'm serious in the implementation of it. But the creative process, you just got to throw everything out the window and just be a little almost like childlike and silly and, I call it impish and just, oh, let's do this. And then you go like, okay. And then you put on your engineering head and make it happen. Well, I wonder to what extent, you know, it might also be, you know, I am willing to experiment and make mistakes. I mean, you know, in my, in my sense, in, in my world, if you don't make mistakes, you're not trying hard enough. If you're not pushing the envelope, you're not trying hard enough. And certainly Porcini mushrooms and thyme make an enormous amount of sense when I think about, you know, the culinary side of things, when I think about salty as opposed to sweet. And it's a little more challenging sometimes when I think about, you know, how do I do this in um, chocolate only? And, you know, if I'm thinking about how would I do this in pastry, you know, if I had, you know, some sort of baked element. So if I was doing something which had a seple cookie and was doing something on top of it, this would be really, really easy to do. And the challenge, you know, here is to go, I'm going to find a way to make it work. It sounds, it sounds ridiculous, but I'm going to go and I'm going to be willing to make mistakes um, because I know that I'm likely to do it. And then to do it with restraint, because it would be really, really easy to make the porcini mushroom just overwhelming. And that's not the point of this. No, I think, I think if there's any trend I'd like to see is seeing more savory flavors in chocolate. I don't think there's enough going on there and there's not enough sort of that door hasn't been opened wide enough yet i think there's some really interesting mm-hmm. possibilities without being give me, i mean i'm against the whole bacon thing and adding bacon as an inclusion uh, that's just 
me personally, but um, even as a Midwesterner, I find that. <laughs> yeah. But um, mm -hmm. I think there's like there's a lot of cultural and sort of flavor mm -hmm. profiles that might be really interesting to go down that road. Well, you know, I have to agree with you there. I, I was involved in the World Pastry Forum and the National and World Pastry Team Championships. And one of the one of the wonderful things that I saw evolve from roughly 2002, 2003, when I first started until roughly 2010, which is when um, they closed down, was that in the very early years, um, the Japanese especially, but also the South Korean team, were just, were just masters of technique. I mean, they they studied the French and they just had all this technique down, but they had trouble with, you know, how do we take, you know, traditional Japanese flavors and make them work for European judges. And I think that one of the things that's really, really happened over that period of time was being able to find a way to make that work. I mean, coffee and cardamom is a really, really classic, particularly Scandinavian, I would think. I mean, you know, I think of cardamom and I think of Denmark and, and Norway and things like that. And it's a really, really um, obvious classic is the word that I want to use. And cardamom is, and there's an inclusion here as well, right? Little bits of cardamom or something? Um, the coffee. Okay. Mm -hmm. But... You have the chocolate, the coffee provides some texture, it provides a bottom, but the cardamom is all just aromatic and up in your nose. It's, yeah, you it here. provides a brightness, right, <clears throat> and a warmth to what's going on, which is really, really quite, really, really quite pleasant. And what I like here so far is I have a classic bar, you know, we've got two of them, the Nicaraguan and the Peruvian. I've got these parallel bars, which, you know, provide the ability to mix and match in what's going in what's going on I, Mondiots. yeah christopher i'm sorry i think it's really important that when i when i saw when i came back from europe i saw a lot of people doing green tea and orange you know um creme brulees but i never saw them doing a perfect traditional creme brulee and i think it's important before you get wacky and do go off on these tangents that you sort of pay homage to the classics and like, okay, we can do this really well. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we make the chocolate that we make it from the beans. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, we show we can do it. We show we can do Nicaragua or a No Way and all the other bars we do. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we can get funky. But a lot of people use the funkiness to sort of hide their lack of classical or even just structural training. And I think it's, you have to, be both. And if you don't, you're going to hit a glass ceiling also. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright was amazing architect, but uh, you don't want to own the Frank Lloyd Wright building right now because <laughs> you have to keep repairing it. So, but had he not had that training, same, he wouldn't have been able to make a lot of the crazy wacky mm -hmm. stuff he had done. So yeah. it's, you have to have a mixture of both, I think. And, you know, you have to just make, you know, 10,000 perfect creme brulees. And then like, you know, I'm going to make a green tea one. And then you can stem from that. And I think that's really important. Or I believe it's maybe because I suffered so long making yeah. it so long that. So a lot of the flavors are very classic. But then right next to it, we have the mushroom thyme. Yeah. Well, and we, we had the, again, you know, we, you know we, we've been fortunate to have the luxury to spend some time talking about this, you know, in part because um, of the holiday week. But, you know, earlier today, we were talking about something you just mentioned, which is, you know, the romance of making chocolate. You know, if you first get into this, there's a romance. And it's like when you first meet someone, another person, and there's this spark of, you know, and there's this intensity. And then over time, it evolves into something. And if, you know, in a relationship, if you end up having children, it becomes something else entirely again. And you said it went from, you know, you know, you know, passion right? And romance into the love. The passion is still there, but it's... It's more deep. It's more meaningful years later. It's not as sexy or fun, but it has more meaning once you've had a partner for longer and you've had kids with that partner and things mm -hmm. like that. And that's what having a company for, you know, I mean, we're still a young fry, I think, but 16 years is longer than some. 
and then making chocolate in Europe, you know, 15 years before that, um, it we're working in another wavelength or brand, bandwidth sort of. We're not, mm. you know, it's the first years of opening a clock were truly exciting and fun, but I'm almost, I'm enjoying it even more now because we can kind of mm. have these passion projects and do wacky things just because we want to, but we also have a clock on the side to sort of showcase things and, we, there, we do a lot of things just because we want to, not because it's a moneymaker. Well, yeah, and I think that you know it's important when we talk about sustainability often, what we do is we talk about sustainability only happening in the producing country. It is something that happens at the farm level. But you know, if what you want to do is you want to be able to support your farmers, for example, um, you need to have a sustainable business. And I think that you know one of the one of the challenges when we get into craft chocolate is if everything you make is a 70% two ingredient single origin chocolate, um, you're, you're focused at a very, very small part of the market right. for which there's an enormous amount of competition. And that, you know, if you're not making, again, you know, something with a salted caramel in it, if you're not making something that, you know, a five-year-old wants to eat, you know, you're, you're, you're not appealing to a market that gives you what we could think of as cash cows. Right, you have products which generate income, which is relatively, relatively predictable, and what that income gives you is the freedom to do these other things. I mean, we've lost we've lost business because we didn't foil wrap back, you know, seven years ago, and we're trying to explain that foil wrapping is a very emotional sort of, mm -hmm. you know, it's it. it Tugs on all sorts of emotional strings, but flow wrapping is the best way to store your chocolate. You know, it seals it, it protects it. It's not sexy having come in this clear, you know, thing, mm -hmm. but, and also doing raw chocolate. I know I might get in trouble, but you know, there's a lot of things, a lot of professors at Penn State about raw chocolate. And I was trying to explain this to the customer and you know, a couple of years down the road, or not, no, actually with them, it's six months down the road, they came back to us and said, oh, okay, you're right. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you have to make a decision what is the best for the product than, than what's best for the emotional, you know, experience for the customer. And so we believe that that overrides anything else. And we've been, you know, and I think, you know, we've talked about, I think blending is going to be really interesting with the craft chocolate makers. And mm -hmm. you see inclusions. And again, you know, we're very good friends. And so this is a little bit biased. But what Fruition and Brian is doing is he doesn't care. He's just not going to stick to the two ingredient. He's going to do whatever makes amazing product. And so, um, yeah, well done, you know. He's ahead of the game. So, and that's what we do at a clot. We're very, obviously that's why we're friends. We have the same mentality, but there's so much interesting things with blending and why wine, they're very seldom do you see wine with one grape variety. And why is that? So mm -hmm. I love the one, you know, the one bean chocolate bars and things like that. But I think we should also run in, you know, mm -hmm. another direction. There's, a, there's so much to do. Well, I mean, you know, you know, people think about blending. I think many chocolate makers think about blending and just the idea of blending is anathema. But they think about blending, I think, in a very, very limited way. They think about, OK, I'm going to take beans from different origins and blend. But there is creative opportunity in just blending different roast profiles. I mean, yeah, this has been done for years and years, and they called it single origin. And that's how they're coaxing out of extra flavor. But right. <clears throat> but they were sort of cheating oh why is it cheating why is it cheating? well i that's mean that's that's why i'm like sort of i mean it's okay it's gotcha. being clever and how to coax it's a single origin but we're going to get we're going to take six different roast profiles we're making more interesting so and that's I, don't think, I don't think there's yeah, and right and so you know i have a particular um dutch chocolate maker heinden vera out of rotterdam and one of the things that i really really appreciate them about them is their approach to blending and one of the things they do is they will do Solera blending or age blending. So they recognize that the flavor will change over time. And what they can do is they can inject newness by doing a very young chocolate, right? With the more established flavor profiles of something which has aged and yeah, you have great. the best of both worlds. And so, 
you know, again, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's just another creative te- technique. We talked about the shape of things like the mandiant, right? And the form of things like the, um, the parallel bars, right? And things like that. These represent, you know, two different ways of being able to do this. I'm, you know, I'm looking at the, um, the caramel collection and, um, you know, it, I'm seeing you're using structure sheets for a decorative technique which is not something you see very often on a conventional. Again, um, that was being way too tired one Christmas season <laughs> and dropping a structure sheet on truffles going, wow, this mm-hmm. no longer are we making little round things and putting it on there. So, um, I mean, like back to the two being, I'm excited about all this. I think everyone has their place and is doing creative, interesting work. And I think it's important to sort of show respect for what everyone else is doing at the same time. I mean, what we're doing is not two bean like, you know, or two ingredient chocolate, but it's really amazing what they're doing. So it's, I think everyone, there should be sort of this play nice and respect what everyone's work. You know, I agree with you. Um, and I want to, I want to, you know, talk about that point. You know, when we think about this world of craft chocolate, specialty chocolate, whatever it is you want to call about it, it is that, this modern movement is only about 25 years old. So Scharfenberger in 1996. And when, if people went back and thought about it, Scharfenberger, you know, he comes from a French background. He comes from Champagne blending. He was a sh- blender, I believe at Vaucle Co. Before he started Scharfenberger wine cellars in uh, the Napa Valley before he started the chocolate business. And so he was all about blending. And so the first, cho- there, there are no single origin chocolates at the beginning of Scharfenberger's business. It was all, you know, let's deliver a particular flavor profile. And it wasn't about let's be dogmatic about this being from Peru or this being from the Dominican Republic or this being from someplace else. You know, there exists room in this world for all of the above. And there's no reason to define ourselves in opposition to something else. You know, what we are is we're not that, right? And, you know, and to be able to say, well, if you add cocoa butter, you're not really a craft chocolate maker, right? Or if you make anything which is below 70%, it can't be good. I mean, these kinds of right. definitions, I mean, we're only 25 years into this. It's way too early to be dogmatic about anything, I think. I mean, I maybe I shouldn't say this, but I remember at FCIA meeting I kind of snuck into and this craft chocolate maker who's been making chocolate for like five years, I think kind of looked at me and said, Oh, you're a remelter. Mm -hmm. Like, what does that, first of all, I'm not, but what does that mean? And why is there just disdain? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, what you do is interesting. What I do is interesting. Mm -hmm. It's just sort of this weird kind of, I don't, I kind of, whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, well, yeah, and there's this interesting definition about what fine means in the particular, you know, aspect of the FCIA. But I think this point for me is really, really important. You know, when I wrote about Ruby chocolate in 2017, after going to Shanghai for the global launch of the product, you know, people who are in this craft chocolate world thought that I was a traitor somehow to craft chocolate. You know, and it, it you know, it, there was a lot of backlash when I said, there's something interesting here. You know, I think you know, irrespective of what we think of Calabato's company, and I have a lot of bad things to say about their sourcing practices and other things like that. They ask really, really interesting questions. And they look to find, you know, it's like, why do why does chocolate have to be brown? Well, it doesn't have to be brown. It's just always thought of that way. And, you know, the fresh beans are, you know, in this shade of pink to purple, for the most part, white to pink to purple. How can we keep that? How can we keep that color and the fresh flavor as we get to a product? I mean, that's an interesting question to ask and answer. Ultimately, it's do we like the way it tastes, right? And I think that this is where the ultimate ar- <clears throat> arbiter, you know, has to be. And you know, if you think about, you know, one of the things you're bringing is you're bringing a you know, a particular style of chocolate making. This is what I learned classically in Europe. There is an, you know, there's a thought about, you know, how that chocolate make is made, but all this, of these other flavors that are associated with it, you know, but you're now working in America and we're not as bound to tradition in some respects. Right. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of 
playfulness as you've talked about there's a lot of freedom to be able to do things you know i just tried one of the caramels um it was the the pear caramel it's sublime um, it's my favorite one no it it, it you know it, it starts off and you know it's it's like is it pear there's almost an appleish component to it. You think and, apple caramel would be the obvious ones, yeah. But the pears, I mean, a bask a bask pear, perfectly ripe, is you know. Yeah. One one thing I'd like to add is you know the classic line in Germany at least is you ask why do you do it that way, and they would say because we've always done it that way, because they've gotten to such a level that they, you know, their bread is so amazing that they no longer really think about. Mm -hmm. you know how they do it or how they can be improved and that's you know you see swiss pastry has declined a little bit because they had such a high level and then they kind of rode mm -hmm. that out mm -hmm. so it's it's fun to be an american to have learned in europe and got the hopefully the you know the base of, of knowledge and then kind of ask questions why mm -hmm. you know instead of just because we've always done it that way um you know, should we make a caramel more liquidy? Should we do this? Should we mm -hmm. inclusions, more butter, less butter? And so we're just playing with that. But like, a, you know, you have to have that base knowledge, I think. And that's mm -hmm. what was really interesting to get from Europe. No, so. I, I, I completely, I, I completely understand the notion of, you know, if you're not a master of technique, right, it becomes difficult to be able to wield that technique specifically in a directed way. I know that if I do X and Y and Z, it's like, you know, trying to be a real bread breaker without understanding hydration properly. You know, if you don't really understand hydration properly, you know, trying to make a particular kind of bread, it's going to be a real challenge. Right? I mean, we're, we're trying to sort of put into our culture that we're almost like studio musicians, that we can do any style of chocolate making if asked to. And we do a lot of side projects and we do a lot of consulting as far as Japan and uh, other places around the world just because we can do so many, if you want the style of that stuff. You know, I remember seeing Luther Allison before he passed away and he literally played B.B. King, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Jimi Hendrix without changing his setup at all. And that's what, I mean, eclat is eclat. And we're kind of in that style. Mm -hmm. But we do so many things left and right that people don't see with other, you know, we build other brands or other lines for other people that you may or may have seen around the world. So we're, that, that gives us time to play and think, you know, it's fun when an amazing, talented chef comes to us and says, we want you to create a line for us because we already know what we know and we know what a clot does. And so, but if we get, if we step out and put ourselves in front of this chef and like, okay, what would he do? And then we kind of get forced to think more creatively. And that's a lot of fun because we do, like, I always joke we're the smallest or we're the largest unknown chocolate business in America, but not that we're large, but we do so many things behind the scenes that we don't get credit for that is just mm -hmm. fun for us. And that's what really motivates the, the mm -hmm. whole team. So. Well, we're almost at the hour, Christopher. And what I want to do is I want to acknowledge yeah. Teresa Grant, who posted from Facebook this interesting comment. Totally agree, Teresa. Right. It's sexy to be able to open something new, taste it, put it back up and then put it away and then come back to it with um, a different time of day with fresh taste buds after having done something else and have just an entirely fresh new encounter with it. I love um, the reseal. Yeah, uh, no. Again, that adds another expense and mm -hmm. where do you draw? And, but in the perfect world, we would have that as well, Teresa. No, absolutely. Um, and then the last piece, this is a another truffle. So that's Peruvian okay. National. This is the Peruvian Nacional truffle. Um, so it is that's truffle in America by Food and Wine three years ago, possibly. Mm -hmm. For those who follow those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So is this enrobed, or is it just a ganache and then rolled in cocoa powder? Yeah, more that than the other. Somewhere okay. in between. Somewhere in between. Um, and it's the same beans used to make the Nacional bar right? and you'll have this flavor in your mouth you know six minutes from now no i mean the thing i like about this if i can and this if people have an opportunity what i would recommend that they go do just for a wonderful taste experience and you know a nine piece box and a bar which has got 10 sections and almost a perfect match 
is that what you can do is you can get a bunch of friends around and share this out. But it's the same, basically the same chocolate. It's the same beans used to make the chocolate. You know? And you have two entirely different texture experiences to be able to do it. You know, so one is the bar. It's got a nib inclusion. And there's this interesting crunchiness to it. And there's a different kind of melt. But you get that same chocolate in a ganache with the cocoa powder around it. And what you've got is an entirely different flavor and texture experience. But there's a commonality between the two. I mean, there is a similarity in flavor between the two. They're just delivering that flavor. We were talking about it earlier, Christopher, releasing, releasing that flavor in very, very different ways. One of which is maybe it has some added cocoa butter, maybe it doesn't, but you know, there's going to be some sort of fat in here, whether it's cream or whether it's butter or whether it's cream and butter in here. And they're going to have an influence in the way um, the aroma molecules melt, the way they hit your tongue, the way they interact with your nose. And yeah, no, if I wanted to, if I wanted to um, really, you know, again, getting together with friends over, over the holidays or the next ones and wanted to do a fabulous experience, I'd say, go get this Peruvian Nacional bar. And if you go to the chocolatelife.com, there is a post on for today's um, live stream. And in the comments in the video, after it's posted live, I will put the links there as well. But what, you'll, what you've got is with this Nacional bar and this box of Nacional truffles, and you've got a really, really wonderful way to explore this particular um, origin. Um, Marignon in the in Peru, the Marignon River Valley in Peru, um, in, a, in a really, really, uh, I would say, you un, almost unique. I don't necessarily know that I know people who are doing both of these things at the same time. Uh, you may know better than I do, Chris. I mean, I love this truffle because I mean, it was so nice. The food and wine mm-hmm. were kind enough to say it's the best truffle in America. But what I, the fact there's no bells and whistles. It's not like the cubes we do with the multi layers and sort of the almost gimmicks this is just cream butter chocolate and to be and it's there's nothing to hide behind so it's almost very japanese and you know the rice is the most important thing in the in the sushi and so that's why this is i love this one for so many reasons uh but the, it's just so it's simplicity at its best well you know and you know we've talked about this on other occasions is that you know when you only have like one ingredient, cocoa beans, put some sugar in it. There's no place to hide. If the beans aren't fermented properly, they're not dried properly. If they're not roasted properly, you know, there's no place to hide in what it is you're doing. And I think that this, this very, very simple ganache, it's exactly the same way. It's just the chocolate and you have to start off with good chocolate. There can't be any defects in the chocolate, right? But then there's only cream and butter. Right. And it's got to be good quality cream and good quality butter, nothing else to do. And so there is a, a there's a purity associated with it. I mean, one of the things I learned a long time ago when you evaluate ice cream, what you do is you judge an ice cream maker based on their vanilla. Right. Because the vanilla is going to be the base pretty much of everything else that they do. And if they can't make a good vanilla ice cream, it's, you know, you, they may not make other ice creams nearly as well. And yeah, if you can make a very, very simple, this may not be hand rolled, but a very, very simple ganache, you know, with, you know, very, very thin enrobed, if enrobed at all, it could be a pavé style, which I happen to really love, um, which would be a slab version of this cut square with just rolled in cocoa powder or green tea. In the French, uh, I love that's. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think about um, when I was uh, in Paris, uh, for the for the first time, you know, with family, is probably 2004, maybe yeah, 2004, 2007, something like that. And going, uh, my, you know, my brain just lost the name of the Japanese, Saruharu Aoki, mm-hmm. you know, and going to the Aoki shop and he had a box of, you know, a just a very, very simple green tea ganache slabbed. So it was a pave style. Um, rolled in just excellent, you know, green tea powder. There's just like no place, no place to hide anything. It has to be just superb ingredients. The restraint. I mean, that's what I hope we're known for. You know, yeah. ones mm-hmm. like the bar or how we, you know, I hate to use manipulate, but the the mondians, 
uh, chef up in New York, known for fish. I'll say that. Um, you, said, you can name names if you want. I mean, you don't have to wink, wink, nudge, uh, nudge. But the simplicity is, is, and the restraint is, I just love that, how we're able to, like, we know when to, like, nope, let's pull back. It's like clothing. To always take one, you know, if you got a scarf and, the, you know, you always take one item off, right, Clay? You, you fashion diva yourself. Yes, absolutely. Well, you can tell I'm a fashion diva because, you know, I'm, you took I'm wearing, the scarf a, pink, off. I'm wearing well a pink shirt. I'm wearing a pink shirt. So you know that, uh, you know that I am. And it's a linen shirt as well. So um, even though it's after after um, Labor Day and one shouldn't be wearing linen after Labor Day. but I thought um, it was white, but oh well. Just white linen after Labor Day? Anyway. So, you know, Christopher, we're here at an hour. Um, and, you know, I want to be respectful of your time and other people here. Sort of, oh, you know, oh, we could go for another five hours. We Put us on a van for... somewhere in South America <laughs> and we'll be talking. Well, and perhaps, you know, what we'll do is we'll we'll go to dinner somewhere and we'll set up a live stream and we'll do um, a dinner or something like that. But what I want to do is I want to give you, you know, uh, you know, a sort of last word here um, for today. You know, just thoughts, you know, in terms of, you know, you know, some experience that you've had, some lesson that you've learned that you'd like to share with people who are watching today or who might be watching this um, in the future? I mean, I hopefully it's the, the obvious. Just be curious. Like, you never know who you might learn from. So uh, I'm just always asking questions and walking up to people and starting out conversations. And mm -hmm. you just never know who that person might be. And that's pretty much probably how we've met first time wherever it was. So um yeah stay positive dedicated and but stay a little silly at the same time the best ideas come when you're silly christopher thank you very much i'm good just going to put a little note on that and the way i think of that is if you're working with chocolate and you're not having fun you're doing it wrong and so you know finding the essential not necessarily humor in it but finding the essential joy in what it is that you're working with, I think is just really important. It's we're working with chocolate. We've got to have fun and, and do that. And with that, I want to say, Christopher, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for thank you, Clay. supplying all this chocolate. I am going to um, enjoy it. Hopefully it will last longer than the weekend, but I can't guarantee that it will. And I'm looking forward to join having you join us again in, in the future. And with that, everybody, we'll be back next Friday. Um, at this time. So either a 10 a.m. start or a noon start, um, I will be posting. And if you haven't had an opportunity, please go like the video and go and subscribe to uh, the Chocolate Wire channel on YouTube. That way you'll get notifications of future of future videos. And while you're at it, go to thechocolatelife.com, join thechocolatelife.com. There's a free membership level and it, it comes with all kinds of nice benefits, in, including some early access to some of the content that's on the website, plus the ability to join our new discussion server, and which I think is really, really interesting um, in terms of building community and having a place to ask and answer questions uh, moving forward. So with that, everybody, um, have a great weekend. I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving and looking forward to having you join us again next week on The Chocolate Life Live. Thank you, everyone.